Oxford American, Gateway Arch National Park, and Jazz St. Louis present Social Change Through the Arts, a civil rights panel discussion at Gateway Arch National Park in St. Louis, Missouri. Support was provided by Jefferson National Parks Association, Stella Boyle Smith Trust, and Gateway Arch Park Foundation. Five panelists and a moderator are in the theater at Gateway Arch National Park, sitting on a stage. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Pam Sanfilippo, Program Manager for Museum Services and Interpretation here at Gateway Arch National Park. And on behalf of our superintendent, Jeremy Sweat, and all of our staff, I'd like to welcome you to the park for the No Tears Project panel discussion, Social Change Through the Arts the first in a series of programs co-presented by The Park, Oxford American, and Jazz St. Louis. As you may know, the old courthouse is currently undergoing renovations that will keep the building closed to the public for the duration of the restoration work. In the meantime, we are continuing to offer programs related to the important civil rights themes of the old courthouse, including the story of Dred and Harriet Scott, two courageous individuals who, on April 6, 1846, 177 years ago, this coming Thursday, sued for their freedom at the old courthouse. Before turning the mic over, I'd like to thank Jefferson National Parks Association, Gateway Arch Park Foundation, and the Stella Boyd Smith Trust, who, through their generous donors, help make programs like this possible. And now I'll turn the program over to Ryan Harris, project consultant for the Oxford American Literary Project. Thank you so much, Pam. Thanks so much for being here, folks. Um, I actually just want to take a minute to thank a, uh, a few more folks and reiterate some of the thanks, uh, our ex extraordinary gratitude for making this project possible. Um, uh, Pam mentioned the Jefferson National Parks Association, the Gateway Arch Park Foundation, and the Stella Boyle Smith Trust, but in particular, um, at the JNPA, I want to say a huge thanks to David Grove, um, who's here today, uh, as well as Ryan McClure at uh, the Arch Park Foundation. Both of these individuals really um, were early adopters in um, being on board with helping bring this project to fruition. They were so patient in conversations and um, just so generous with their time and their commitment to doing this work. Um, and it's, it's rare when you do these sorts of, of projects, especially ones that um, are, um, are messy, that, that have difficult uh, history and difficult topics that organizations and people really put their money where their mouth is and step up and fund them. So I want to say a huge thanks to all those organizations and those individuals in particular for doing that. Um, I also want to say a huge thanks to Pam San Filippo standing next to me. Um, who I think the best visual I could give you is describing her as a Jack Russell Terrier. Um, she has endless energy and has been on the phone and on email for a year as we brought all these projects together with me and has been the primary liaison on the ground here at the park. So I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for the work that you do. And then lastly, there's two individuals who really have supported the No Tears Project since inception um, in 2016. I think deserves some special recognition. The first is a woman named uh, Robin White, who is the superintendent of Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. And the second is Tarona Armstrong, who's the deputy superintendent of Gateway, um, Gateway Arch National Park right here in town. And um, in my mind, both of these women are really exemplary public servants. Um, they have had I think three decade careers, each of them with the National Park Service, uh, and have really been these humble, I think often quiet, silent um, warriors who, whose work throughout their lifetime has helped protect and preserve and interpret some of our country's most valuable cultural and, and, and natural resources. And in, in being public servants and being at the Park Service, you know, the work is about the sites, the work is about the public, it's not about them. And so their, their selflessness really never ceases to amaze me. And, and I want to commend what they've done, and in particular over, over their lives, working to protect things that are important, important sites and stories related specifically to the American Civil Rights Movement. So thank you so much, uh, Pam and uh, 
thank you so much to Rona and Robin. Okay, so let's jump to today. So why are we here? Well, um, I'm gonna let the panelists and the panel uh, do the talking here in a minute, but I do want to leave you with this uh, important historical context. We started No Tears Project seven years ago. We thought we were just producing a single concert honoring the civil rights heroes of the Little Rock Nine, a one and done. Uh, yet because of the power, I believe, of the arts and music in particular to unite people and to facilitate difficult conversations and uh, speak uh, truth to power and speak uh, about messy history. Here we are presenting the No Tears Project in its fifth city. Um, and really, it, it's, it's become this project that provides a way that we, um, we, we explore reconciliation, uh, recognition before reconciliation. Um, and using the arts and music in particular, um, it's this non-threatening way of, of bringing communities together. So um, we hope as you leave here today, or if you're watching this, that perhaps if nothing else that you get out of this, that you are reminded of our common humanity um, and that we're not so different from one, one another when it really comes down to it. And so if you're inspired by that, we hope you'll come back to some of the other events that are happening uh, in April, April or in the, on the 26th of April, we'll be right back here for a panel discussion. And then we're gonna premiere, uh, the world premiere of some new poetry, some new music, some new dance that'll be performed and that was created by many of the people on the stage here tonight, or this afternoon. So thank you so much for being here, thanks for coming. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator, Treasure Shields Redmond. Welcome, 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 everyone. I'm Dr. Treasure Shields Redmond, your erstwhile poet, a dual citizen of East St. Louis, Illinois, and Meridian, Mississippi, here to share with you an incredible conversation about social change and the arts. I want to begin, and I don't want you to think I was rudely looking at my phone while he was talking. I have my notes on my phone. But I do want to begin by talking about how the arch although it is impressive and imposing in its structure, is part of the two-sided coin of the US, and on the other side is the genocide of our native siblings. I want to give an, a land acknowledgement to the Iowa, the Cahokia, the ancient Mississippian people who created a civilization that was like the New York Stock Exchange of these Americas, as we call them now. How do we know? because artifacts from as far away as deep South America were found in what is today Cahokia, Illinois, Cahokia Heights, Illinois, and East St. Louis, Illinois. So I wanna shout out the Iowa, the Kickapoo, the ancient Mississippians, the Cahokians who built the mounds that some of our older grandparents and parents played on before they were rudely destroyed. I want to offer thanks for them and offer a moment of silence for our native siblings. If you don't mind, we'll just bow our heads briefly or just remain silent briefly. Thank you so much for your respect on that acknowledgement. I'm going to take a moment to let you know who all is here. Y'all don't talk about my dollar store glasses. Um, who all is here today by reading briefly from their bios. Uh, to your far right, the first person seated over there is Brian Owens. He's an R&B soul artist from Belleville, Illinois. He shares a YouTube viral video with his father, Thomas Owens, of a song that means a lot to both of them. Uh, they're singing, A Change Is Gonna Come. Brian has pursued a professional music career and has released eight albums to date. Next to him is the uh, talented founder, artistic, and executive director, Ashley Tate. Um, she is an assistant professor of dance at North Carolina at Charlotte and founder, artistic director, and executive director of Ashley Ann Dance Company a professional performance organization based in St. Louis. 
Next to Ashley is Mr. Victor Goins, a jazz saxophonist and clarinetist who has served as president and chief executive officer of Jazz St. Louis since September 2022. He's also has been the director of jazz programs at Juilliard um, and has been a member of the jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra and the Wynton Marcellus Septet since 1993. Next to him is the talented Kelly Hurt. For, for Miss Hurt, uh, music is a family affair. Her heritage takes her back to songs of the past and sitting around the house singing with her family. Her musical accomplishments include winning the Phillips Award for Best New Artist from the Memphis chapter of the Academy of Recording Arts and Scientists. Uh, sciences, rather. <laughs> um, she has worked with Screamin' Jay Hawkins, recording the song Coulda, Woulda, Shoulda, which was produced by Jim Dickinson at Phillips Recording Service. And finally, next to me, we have Mr. Chris Parker. And I have to move to my photos to look at his bio. There we go. All right, so Chris Parker grew up as a young piano prodigy in North Little Rock, Arkansas. He subsequently earned a bachelor's and master's degree in jazz and commercial music performance with an emphasis in 20th century classical piano repertoire and jazz composition and arranging from the University of Memphis. Oh, we both have degrees from the University of Memphis. Uh, prior to his time as an educator in Little Rock, Parker was an instructor in Bronx, at what school was it, Chris? It's called. It was it was called Mind Builders in on Oldenville Road in South Bronx. Wonderful. So Chris Parker is a um, talented musician, composer, and producer, and we are lucky to have him here. I present to you our esteemed panelists. So let's begin. This panel is about social change in the arts, and I just wanted each of you in any order you want, to lift up the name of an ancestor artist in your field who you believe produced social change. And tell us briefly why. I'll jump out since I'm first in line. <laughs> uh, I chose uh, an artist named Dizzy Gillespie. Mm -hmm. Most of you probably aware of him. He's the trumpet player with the bent horn and the, the big cheeks. And he was a very for a certain period of American history, very well-known person. He was on many movies, public TV. Behind the scenes, he also ran the United, the United Nations Orchestra, where he brought together North American, South American musicians, African musicians, basically any combination of world musicians that he thought of in order to present a more full picture of the possibility of music. But the reason I chose him was not necessarily political, he actually affected change that was practical and based in reality. One of those was he started uh, a relationship between the New York Jazz Foundation and a hospital in New Jersey to where jazz musicians in New York City could get free health care. I found this out because I have a friend who was basically born with rheumatoid arthritis. He's in his 70s now, he's still very functional, but he had a hip replacement in the 80s, and that was the first operation sponsored by this initiative that Dizzy basically went and found a doctor who was high up in a hospital and, and put resources and used his connections instead of talking about musicians can't get health care. Everything's unfair. Why are these musicians not allowed the same access to quality this and what, what he did? He said, I'm going to give them health care. <laughs> and that ended that question. And it's still in effect today. In fact, my friend still goes to that hospital and he's a functional drummer. He's played with Randy Weston, Roland Hanna, uh, uh, Pharaoh Sanders, uh, uh, Sonny Fortune. He's a beautiful drummer. Uh, but he, and it, to this day, still has rheumatoid arthritis and has to have his hip changed out every now and then. But none of that would have been possible without Dizzy Gillespie. Beautiful. I'll hop in, I guess. So that question, there could be so many answers, I think, for all of us. But it didn't take me long to quickly go right to Catherine Dunham um, for so many reasons, right? Um, but I'm going to share just a personal very personal reason. I remember when I was first 
starting out in dance and I was raised in dance studio but definitely culturally dancing my whole life and I always wanted to fuse all of that together how can I bring what I learned from just my mom grandma in the house dancing you know Saturday Sunday you know and mixing it with the things the new concepts I was learning in the dance studio space and when I was first starting out I, I I didn't really, I didn't know much about Catherine Dunham. I knew who she was. I knew that she was a historian and an activist and so much reach. But I didn't really know much about the technique and the style. And when I learned how she just so beautifully mixed everything that she did and created her own technique, her own style, it gave, it inspired me to realize that I can do what I want with my dance. I can be anything I want. I can do what I want. I can use all these influences to make something that's very personal and special to me. And that changed the course of how I went about teaching dance and creating dance. Um, and then on top of that, just all of her work in the socio-political sector, it, as I developed in that way, I started out just wanting to entertain. And I still love that too. But I started to develop my voice, and Catherine Dunham was definitely the inspiration for just figuring out that I can do that. I can be this black woman living in St. Louis, doing my thing, loving all the things I love, and speak through my dance, because that's, that is where I felt brave, is when I was moving and when I was uh, talking about dance. So definitely Catherine Dunham came first, even though there's many. Mm. Okay, I would say Louis Armstrong, and it doesn't hurt I'm from New Orleans. <laughs> so, um, but Mr. Armstrong, you know, grew up in a very, very difficult time in New Orleans, um, being impacted much by, by lots of the, the social discriminations that took place in, that, in, in the country at that time. Um, but he's so significant for me because in spite of it all, he was not only able to overcome those challenges, but he also found a way to look to people to see who they were in spite of, of all the discrimination that may have happened in others in the community. He was very, very instrumental in having integrated bands throughout his career. Um, from a musical point of view, I would say Armstrong, he redefined what it means to be virtuosic. Mm -hmm. And virtuosic is often defined by how fast a person can play a music or how acrobatic or athletic they could be and what they do. But when you hear Louis Armstrong play, his virtuosity is, is in a way that he makes you realize that anyone should be able to do what he does. Thank you. Oh, I guess it's me. Um, I'm going to say Curtis Mayfield. And I could give lots of reasons as to why. Um, I, I think... Curtis Mayfield, from the work that he did with the impressions to the soundtracks like Claudine and Superfly or just his own music, I think he created music with an excellence in a way that like really, whether they wanted to see it or not, like revealed to people that like the black experience was a human experience, um, that it's not monolithic. Um, and the other reason why I really love Curtis Mayfield is that he was instrumental in the development and the career growth of hometown person who would probably would have been my first, if not for Curtis, is Donny Hathaway, um, who his first producing job was with Curtis out of Chicago. And I think that definitely, you know, helped Donny become a lot of what he was. But yeah, I just, I think Curtis Mayfield, you know, he brought the sacred and the secular and, and merged those things in such a way that it really provided a window into the experience that we have here. Well, I'm going to be personal. Beautiful. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, I'm going to say our mentor, Alvin Fielder, for me. And the reason was later in my development, he gave me, he was a drummer. And he gave me specifically the permission to be a vocalist to sing among instrumentalists. I think we, you were talking earlier about how 
we as women, and we wanted to play instruments, and like I, I told you, I played piano and drums, and they were like, oh no, you don't want to do that, you want to be a vocalist. Well, all of the women in my family were vocalists, so I was like, I, they're way better than me, so I don't, I don't really have a voice. And so it wasn't until later when I hooked up with him, not only was he doing open and free music, but he simply said to me, why don't you play a duet with me? Now he's a drummer and I'm a singer and I'm going, play a duet, you, you wanna do that? He's like, you seem like you wanna do it. And so he gave me the confidence to be a singer and to be able to play with instrumentalists using my voice mm. as an instrument. And that was really important for me later on. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful uh, cacophony of ancestors up in the air now. So Chris talked about an, a great artist affecting health care, which is a huge system that feels like we can't make a dent in it. But they took their influence and created a way for musicians to receive health care. And then Ashley talked about a great artist being an avatar, being a standard bearer, showing you what you can be right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, they say representation matters. So that's what we would say about Catherine Donham, hashtag representation matters. Yes. And then Victor talked about an artist being a virtuoso. One of my favorite pictures is of him playing his trumpet outside of the pyramids in Egypt. And, you know, I'm thinking about um, also that standard bearer piece, but also having boundaries. You know, Gen Z talks a lot about establishing boundaries, which are important. And the person that you mentioned was somebody who established boundaries. He decided he wasn't going to come back south mm -hmm. because he just wasn't going to be disrespected in that way right. uh, by the structures in place. Mm -hmm. but, but I still felt like he never stopped loving on us with he his music, did. his choices. Yeah. But he had a place where he just couldn't go to. Um, Brian talked about an incredible artist who, you know, songs like Keep On Pushing. And that made me project forward to It's Gonna Be All Right. Right? So it's that same. And I love the intellect in the artistic choices because, of course, just like bad poetry, you could say, White people, you hurting us, and da da da. Or you, <laughs> or you could say, keep on pushing. And people get all of that from that, right? It's not didactic. It's not simple. It's encouraging, but it's not Pablo. It's not saying, don't fight. So that was fantastic. And then, of course, Kelly with the Meridian Mississippi native, Mr. Fielder, um, with the mentorship, which is so important. Mentorship is so important. Um, so, which leads me to my next question. What do you see as your role in producing change with your work? Is it mentorship? Is it attacking institutions? Is it representation? Is it making sure art can be seen in different ways? What is it? What is your role? I think um, I always call us um, accidental artist advocates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is mm -hmm. because we like to, I grew up with all of the arts surrounding me and with all of the arts providing examples of lifestyles, providing examples of how you can use your work and live your work in order to bring about change. Not necessarily, you, you don't have to go storming anywhere, you don't have to call anybody out, but literally by living your art, you can create a change in your community, in your environment, and just even if you affect one someone, that is, that's always been kind of important in our work. Because it starts with one someone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Just totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But the mentorship piece too. Sorry. Um, but. But what you're what you're saying, Kelly, is like this this 
kind of top level and then trickling down. I'm thinking about mentorship when you said yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes things, I don't know, sometimes you just don't get to choose yeah. your causes or your course of action or anything. With us, it really does choose you. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it chooses yeah. you. Yeah. And you have the ability to say, well, yeah, I want to go for it with this or you have the ability to say, let me step back. Sometimes it's in the ways that you step back yeah. that bring you even more mm. to the forefront. And I just, I just really feel like the mentorship involves living by example. Exactly. It kind of works. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, just a, a personal example of that is for so long I wanted, I've been teaching hip hop dance and jazz dance in the private studio sector for a long time. Um, so we're talking like K through 12 age, um, people who have the, the money, to be honest, to have access to studio training. Um, and then I switched, or I didn't switch, but I kept doing that, but I felt, felt this calling to work in, um, at a charter school Mm -hmm. here in St. Louis and I realized like how much talent was living in this school and they didn't have access to private studio training and then that fell into okay you've been teaching hip hop and jazz for a long time and this is the this is your this is the the work of, of your culture your people and you're teaching it only in private dance studio sector um, because they have the money and, and the access to, to mm. do so and I was having trouble with that that was troubling me that I'm teaching these styles where I'm about culture and community and the voice of, of, of my people, to be perfectly honest, but I wasn't teaching it and sharing it with the community that I was talking, you know. <laughs> and so when I ended up teaching at this um, charter school, that's the whole reason I went back to grad school is because I needed, I felt, this personal mission to be able to go into higher ed where the students are becoming teachers and, and getting you know the, the, the certificate that says they can teach, I felt that I needed to, to train them to be able to connect and to understand what they're actually teaching. Um, so instead of, oh, there's this cool hip hop move or this you know teaching jazz only from Giordano on and not knowing the history, not knowing Dizzy Gillespie, not knowing like the jazz music that created the dance. I felt this personal mm -hmm. mission mm -hmm. to, to make sure that I was teaching that way and I was connecting with the people that I was teaching about, but also making sure that I was helping to raise the new generation of teachers and educators who were going to be the influence over the young kids who were learning about these very cultural social styles. Mm -hmm. um, that was important to me. So it's completely changed. Like you were saying, you fall into something. It's completely changed the way I teach or why I teach or why I even dance or perform. Mm. I felt this, this calling and this mission in myself to make sure that I was really about what I said I was about. Mm. And I really mm. don't think for a long time, perfectly honest, that I really was. Mm. You know, I was, I was doing the dance, you know, <laughs> not, to, not to be like... <laughs> I know, yeah. but, uh, but also I was, I was falling right back into the, the, the structure and the, um, the appropriation in, in certain ways. Obviously, I'm a black woman doing jazz and hip hop, but at yes. the same time, it was the way I was teaching it, the way I was disseminating the information that I was not happy with anymore, to be honest. And I can say that publicly. It is what mm -hmm. it is. But now I realize how much that... that that means something to me going forward. So in that sense, I feel very much like a political agent or an agent of change or an mm -hmm. activist or an advocate because I'm making sure that I'm going back to the source of, 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 of what's important in these, in these styles of dance. So, mm. yeah. Wow, so, so many connections there. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you were talking, I definitely wanted Victor to chime in because, and I don't know if Victor, if we were thinking about some of the same things, but you know, um, the beloved ancestor, Miles Davis, who we don't know if he's in heaven or hell, 
Maybe he's in jazz heaven. That's a whole other <laughs> section. But Because um, earlier we were saying, you know, you have those late night conversations as a musical person. Yeah. Who would be in your ultimate band? Who would be in your ultimate lineup, living or dead? And Chris said, are we going to heaven or hell? Yeah. And <laughs> the first thing I thought was, all the best musicians in hell. That's but <laughs> but um, I don't know if Victor was thinking about, even 60 years ago, Miles was complaining about the audiences getting wider and wider. Mm -hmm. And how does an artist navigate? Mm -hmm. it, 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 am I slipping over into minstrelsy? Am I, you know what I'm saying? Or, or are these just people who are enjoying the music? Like, where's the line there uh, when you're trying to move the culture forward? Well, Miles probably is wherever the gig is at right now. Right. <laughs> okay. True. But, um... <laughs> You know, there have always been those discussions about how, how much is too much. Enough is a word that is something I consider every day as a person, as a musician, as an educator, as a leader of Jazz St. Louis. Um, and I don't always mean it in, in, in a fact of, um, of limiting, but how much more I need to do, maybe. Have I done enough to move it forward? Mm -hmm. So, um, but when you talk about it in the terms of um, the menstrual aspect of it, it it's, it's a very... Um, difficult conversation that people want to have many times. And you have to consider the environment maybe that took place, the, the, the cultural situation or the, the, the social situation people were growing up and, um, and trying to not only produce art but try and survive on a day-to-day -day point. Um, there's a great piece that Winton has called The Ever Funky Lowdown. And um, <laughs> that's one of his social change pieces. And he talks about all of those things in it. In fact, there's even one other piece that's even more um, detailed about it. It's a speech he did for Nancy Hanks the year President Obama was inaugurated, his first term of president. Mm -hmm. And he speaks about many of those different types of things up there. I invite you to go there and get the, the information firsthand as opposed to a secondhand mm -hmm. version of it. But I think at the end of the day, we all have to realize we have to be who we are. And, and but we have to fly under the banner of what it is, and not under a banner that's something else, you know. And and that for me, that's always a very, very intense conversation and a difficult one sometimes, or I should say, challenging. I don't like the word difficult. Challenging conversation because um, the commercial aspect of the music mm. industry requires mm. things to fit under banners yeah. to try to sell things. But in fact, there could still be individual things that are very, very clear. You talk about Prof Fielder. Mm -hmm. I, when, as soon as she said Prof Fielder, I, my eyes you know, opened. My, I, got, <laughs> I had a great smile because I knew him. And uh, he was truly an independent person and an individual who's, who, who helped mu move the music forward by playing what his belief was about it. And he could play, he played free jazz most of the time, but he can play mm -hmm. jazz that was inside of forms and things of that nature. So it, that's a challenging question about those particular areas you're talking about, but I think if we get to the challenging conversations, then we can actually have some social change. Mm. Uh, uh, Ryan mentioned Robin from the National Park Service down in Little Rock, Arkansas. Just tacking on to what he just said, and part of this whole mission of the project, and she said it, we played a concert in the area of Tulsa known as Black Wall Street. And she did a uh, invocation, I guess it was. And the, the phrase that s just stuck with me the whole time is, it's hard to move forward or to reconcile when you haven't aired out your baggage yet. Mm. Yes. And sometimes that's, can be, like, as Victor's point, it can be an awkward conversation. You have, me being a white artist, I'm gonna comment on it. If you have all black musicians of every different commercial and uncommercial diaspora, well, who, well, what's the, who's doing the right thing here? That could be a very awkward and heated discussion, just like m most of the politics and social issues in the United States in the last half a decade can be very divisive discussions. However, if we don't eventually air it out, it's like being at the dinner table and no one can say nothing. And then everybody's just mad and they don't digest their food properly. So, and they don't know why they're mad. So yeah, to, to, to air out some of the baggage, maybe not 
have to get, as Obama said, pugilistic. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't have to become pugilistic to air it out. You can also have some decorum and mostly just respect for other people and their viewpoint and allow them to air their baggage or their truth. And sometimes music, especially, I'm going to say, I'm going to take some for jazz music, especially jazz music, has always been a place where you get intellects of many backgrounds, many ethnicities, many stories, not just musicians, but people in audiences, in clubs. You run across the guys, who are you? Well, I'm a poet. You know, who are you? Well, I'm a local activist. Well, who are you? Well, I'm a... I'm a minister who loves jazz. It's, a, it's always brought certain type of personalities together. And the rule I've always found is if you're cool, everybody else is cool. And so not to be too informal, but that's one of the beautiful things about American art form. It does allow everyone to come to the table. That's also why I believe that certain American art forms may or may not have been suppressed in a systematic way. I'm not going to comment on that. Preach. I'm going to let you <laughs> marinate on that. Preach. But I will say, I'm going to close one time because I'm, I'm waiting for Brian Owens because I'm seeing him over there itching. But, I'm uh, itching, man. I, uh, <laughs> well, it, it's something in his mind. It's something in his mind. I, but uh, Kelly's brother is a great musician named James Hurt, pianist. We were in Memphis together. I would get a job driving people around. Milt Jackson, great vibraphone player, comes to town. I go get... Noonie, we call him Noonie. Man, I got Milt Jackson, I got a Maxima, let's go. <laughs> Milt Jackson laid some of the heaviest in terms of the, the kind of seemingly off the cuff remark I made about systematically repressed. Mm. He was the first one to put it in my mind because he said, you know, uh, Secret Service was watching Rossan Roland Kirk in the 60s. They had code words for him to leave the building when Secret Service agents and federal agents would enter the building because he was blind. Uh, they would say, Bob Crosby is in the house. Bob Crosby was a famous white big band leader. Mm -hmm. So if, if that got, if Bob Crosby was in the house, Roland Kirk would disappear in between tunes. He said Dizzy was another one. These people were targeted by the, the government. Mm -hmm. Some of them put on watch lists and enemies lists in certain decades. But he said, in his opinion, they took jazz out of its neighborhood, where of its, its root culture, and put it, no offense to institutions, because we all got degrees up here. <laughs> they put it in institutions, and they changed the demographic that had access to it. Mm. In other words, in, the, in common man language, they took jazz out the hood because it was enlightening to the minds of the people in those neighborhoods, and they did not want those people enlightened by a thought-provoking music mm. made by intellectual, very thoughtful people. They didn't want that. Mm. And I said, man, that's crazy, man. Mel Jackson, man, you're talking some stuff. Well, I lived a few more years and said, man, mm -hmm. you might be something to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Ancestors needed you to say that, Chris. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was working on my dissertation, I was sharing that it's about the sound of black women's voices. And um, uh, I wrote this phrase, something like, when our ancestors who had liberated themselves picked up the bugles, I, you know, off of dead Confederate soldiers and turned it into jazz. And I, I remember my, um, my dissertation chair was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are things that happen. So um, we, we understand that what you just shared with us, Chris, about governmental forces in the U.S. understanding jazz's impact and import. And when you called it the intellect, that it drew intellectuals, that is our intellectual music. And that is why it is not uh, the pop you learn music uh, right now is because it is the intellectual music. And it just reminds you again and again that, you know, oftentimes we're made to believe that the enemies of good and the enemies of right uh, are not smart, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, if you're if you have on a Klansman's hood, you must be chewing a cigar and breaking your verbs and not very smart. But the truth is, smart and moral or smart and having integrity are two separate things. You can be smart and be amoral, have no integrity, which harm and hurt on people. And you can be smart and be moral and have integrity and wish to, to not harm anyone. So, you know, Chris, what you, what you shared is, is, is true. It's documented. Mm -hmm. These watch lists are documented. Um, yes. James Brown. James Brown was put on that watch list. And Nixon had him in the White House and put him on the watch list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Madam Catherine Dunham. Mm -hmm our incredible dance ethnographer yep. who went to Haiti, yep. um, collected stories, became initiated in Voudon, yes. uh, for some reason, blessed East St. Louis yes. <laughs> and said, I'm going to throw my lot in yeah. with the young activists there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my, was it a Danforth mm -hmm. grant mm -hmm. and open a training center, pay people, bring more, more charm, mm -hmm bring these incredible people and teach dance and move the culture forward, she was on the watch list. For sure. I have a copy of it because I downloaded those about some yeah. East St. Louis history that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So you would think, well, dance can't provoke change, but apparently it can. Oh, uh, yeah. Because the government <laughs> had a file on her and assigned someone to watch her right. up there in Edwardsville, Illinois. Right. So... Um, with that being said, the, the, I want to move to, because our performance-heavy panel mentioned something, and there's a question that I sent out. I want to make sure I asked it correctly. So it says, uh, there it is, how has the emergence of streaming platforms and or TikTok, et cetera, impacted art and artists. And I'm moving to that area because we're, we, we now have moved to what is popular. Um, so what, what are you guys thinking about that? Technology has always been, right? And I think for artists, it just becomes, you know, the idea of like, how are you going to utilize it? Because we can complain about it, and it's not going to change it. We can be mad about it, but it's not going to change it. And we can have all kinds of ideals about what it should be, but that doesn't necessarily change it. Um, I, I, I think that we have to be wise as creatives in thinking about how we utilize those platforms to engage people with whatever message that we want to engage them with. Um, I, I think it's definitely been detrimental to attention span. I think it's been I think it's been detrimental to, you know, people really digging into being about a craft, mm -hmm. as opposed to being about, you know, the idea that I can put ten minutes into something mm -hmm. and be known for it before I even know what it is I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I but the only thing now here's what I can do. The eight to ten creatives that are in my life that God placed there right now that I'm responsible for, I can teach them what it is to me to responsibly use those platforms. Right. Right. Mm. Exactly. And then we train up a whole other generation of people and teach them. And then they teach them. Like just for me being responsible for what I feel like I can bring right. in teaching them how to utilize those platforms. But also teaching them like don't demonize them. Like, you're going to use them, you're going to need them, but it's how you do that. Right. And I think with anything, mm -hmm. that really is what becomes the, the issues. But I'm certainly grateful to all of our brothers and sisters, like, you know, Sound Diplomacy, mm -hmm. these, these folks who are trying to, like, move the needle on, on royalties and, mm -hmm. and, diff and different things like that. But at the right. same time, I'm not dependent on that. Right. Mm. I'm not dependent right. upon the government to do right by me. That's right. Mm. You know what I'm saying? The only thing I control is whether or not I can do right by the people who are in my life. And so sometimes for me, it's less about like what the institution can do and it's how can I become an institution. Mm. Yeah. Well, put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I don't think that has anything to do Mic with drop. royalties, but yeah. no, stream, that's, streaming. That's but, I think, but I think utilizing things yeah. in that way and thinking about it, thinking think like an institution okay how can i utilize this how can we leverage this to create economic 
scale for 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 the folks that we that we work with, as yeah. opposed to always complaining about what isn't. Mm. Well, I just I just want to add before other people jump in. You know that I have a a, a secret history <laughs> as a as a Mississippian. I fell in love with hip hop uh, in junior high, and then my group. I formed a gospel group and a hip hop group because that the, that's the era and the time that I was raised in, and the 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 rap group got a record deal with MC Hammer's record label. We put out a record, One Cause One Effect. Okay, you can Google it now, <laughs> and uh, but not in here because there's no internet. <laughs> but suffice it to say, since we got our deal in like 1990. Mm-hmm. It was still, you know, the sharecroppers deal, right? It was the deal that everybody's going to court to fight now. Yes, it's, yes. It was the deal that everybody's rewriting their stuff on sound exchange for now, me, me included. So I was so surprised, but sadly not surprised, when I heard young performing artists talking about 360 deals. So I'm talking a little bit of inside ball here br- briefly. So... The record deal I signed made sure I owned nothing, and I would have to tour to make my money. That's right. Maybe they gave me writer's points. Thank goodness that I can write. So I have received royalties on writers, but the truth is my group produced the music and wrote the music, then went out there dancing and doing the hammer man like hammer, performing the music. We should own our masters. <laughs> as all artists should, but we do not. And we receive pennies while somebody who wasn't even in the studio gets money. Mm -hmm. That said, after us, all these young, incredible people like Puff Daddy, like uh, Luke Skywalker, like um, incredible artist uh, Master P out of New Orleans, Mm -hmm. Decided to create their own labels, do their own distribution, even if they had to sell it out their trunk. And when they did partner with a label, they had to come to them on their own terms. So, which is why their money looks the way it does today. The record companies came up with the 360 deal, which is the same thing, just in different, <laughs> the different, it's the sharecropper de- deal again. And I was so surprised that young people were once again falling for it. Um, <laughs> because it's less work. Mm-hmm. Hey. Yes. Hey. It's okay. less risk. Thank you. And it's less about you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's more of a chance that you may spend your life doing something that is never commercially successful, even if it has community impact. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And your ego doesn't like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's why you would rather sign a deal to get something then the work could potentially have nothing, but it's because your value proposition is off. Yes. Ooh. Yep. I'm done. Ooh. Hey. Look at Brian. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads me to the Beyonce-fication of our tastes, the Beyonce-fication of our aspirations. Um, our aspirations are to be the one famous billionaire. When the truth is, we could make better than a good living if we changed our focus and looked at not signing to major labels, not be being beholden to major institutions. So that's just my, uh, but I, yes, exactly what you said, everything you said. Someone else jump in if you want to say something. Okay, I'm going to get in a little <laughs> bit of this. Okay, first of all, you know, we've all seen Ray, so we know that. Yes. He, he took a risk. He took that high risk you were talking about. Uh, where he could have just let them own the masters, but he just said, I'm going to own my own masters. Um, but there have been other artists who have taken the same risk, and, and, and I can only relate to the things. It, well, that's not true, but I'm going to talk about the things close in my circle. So, you know, I think about Wynton Marcellus, for instance, when he first came out on Columbia Records, yeah. and he told me the story how when Dr. George Butler, who was running, he was producing all of those, um, Herbie was actually working with him on his first record. And uh, they had... They had Winton identified to kind of be the next Tom Brown, who was a, a trumpet player at that time. Jamaican funk was his tune that he, he got a big hit off of. So Winton went in to the studio and did his record. He came back and when Dr. Butler got it and heard all of this jazz, original compositions and standing, he looked at Herbie and said, man, what is this, man? Herbie said, well, man, let him do what he wants to do. He's, he's prepared. He's got a plan. He's got this. So Winton was over. He was willing to, not even was able to, he was willing to take his path regardless of what the outcome was he was not going to actually 
play a music that was not significant to him and his upbringing that his father had played and people in New Orleans had played. I, I agree with you totally in terms of the lack of investments that musicians want to take inside of their own um, careers. So many times everybody in the 1980s was looking for a demo to turn into a record company to yeah. sell their thing and ultimately get signed and get minimal that's right. Contract money to go on tour that was funded and all of that kind of stuff. But I saw Ellis Marcellus take a different path. He had his own record label called Elm. Hmm. And even I can go a little bit further back to a gentleman named Alvin Baptiste. Yeah. Well, Harold Baptiste, yeah. I should say. Yeah. And Profil to play on these records too, where Harold Baptiste had a record label in New Orleans called All for One or AFO. Hmm. And he recorded the musicians who were in that community to give them a, an outlet to have their music documented. Yeah. So the short answer to that is like everybody has to take their own responsibility to document themselves. Mm -hmm. As a musician, my, my major goal was to make sure when I closed my eyes, my name was mentioned at least once in the books in the history of jazz. Wow. Because there were so many musicians prior to me who played so much better than me, who were so much more brilliant than I am, mm -hmm. but unfortunately they were never documented. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we don't know that history. And, and oral histories tell more truth sometimes than written histories. Please. So <laughs> I, I agree with you. Musicians and, and artists, dance, everyone have to invest in themselves because if, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, then you shouldn't anticipate someone else is going to invest in you. Right. Mm. I'm going to hop in for TikTok and dance. <laughs> and that's it. That's, that's the post. Um, but that's the tweet. So I, I don't know if it's a curse or what it, this is about me, but I'm always trying to find a silver lining. Um, so I'll speak on both sides of the coin. One thing that TikTok positively <laughs> has done is there is exposure to, they call them niche styles, but I don't like that word um, for many reasons. But I'm thinking about house dance and funk styles and things that don't perfectly fit in a proscenium uh, style of, of presenting dance or something they can't see on TV. I'm thinking about styles that are inherent to the culture yeah. that don't get exposure so what people do is they create their own idea of what they think something is and then start teaching it to others and <laughs> that's where I have an issue uh, so one thing about TikTok I can say are companies like Versa Style in LA who teach authentic hip-hop and street dance forms because it's not all one there's hip hop, there's locking, there's popping, there's voguing, and, and they all have their own technique and their own style. And I do see, maybe I'm on the right side of TikTok uh, in that way, <laughs> but I'm seeing all this exposure to different styles, so my students ask about them. Mm -hmm. Then on the other side of the coin, what happens is people learn, learn from TikTok, and then they go and make money teaching steps but haven't immersed themselves in the foundation behind the step mm. you know and so so I'm like oh exposure yay but then on the other side of it there's no cultural history and connection and I I will say to the end that when you understand the why of something you're gonna you're gonna embody it differently and in fact I don't want to use the word better but you're gonna have this embodiment of the style which is going to make you stronger technically mm -hmm. um, so that's where I'm going back and forth with TikTok. but like you said I tried it in my own personal ripple of the world my own world I try to make sure that what I'm at least at least I'm the vessel for change for this group and if we can and if we can keep you know, doing yes. that, you know, maybe yes. we'll all get the, yes. the, the, the style, the culture the, in, in a way that is, that is um, giving the style, the culture, the, the, what, it, what it deserves. And so that's, that's kind of where I am with, with, with TikTok. It, the, the exposure, yes, but on the other side of it, how are we using it, like you said, Brian? So, yeah. Mm. Can I just add a couple, two things to that? I, of course. Great. I, I just want to quickly say thank you so much for that deep, deep and wide uh, response regarding dance. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Victor. There was a great tenor saxophonist by the name of Jimmy Heath. Mm -hmm. And he was one of three brothers called the Heath Brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Heath, one of the, the last times I saw him down in Atlanta, which is where he ended up living, 
Um, the short of the conversation he said was that you cannot know where you're going to unless you know where you came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was just as hip as anybody who was in their 20s. His son, M. Tume, was a great musician as well. So Mr. Heath was on top of so many th different things. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said about the usage of technology, mm -hmm. you know, because I often think about what technology provides, but what it doesn't develop is our memory component inside of our brains. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have a, a need to have to memorize memorize things. If I think about mm. my phone number as a kid, I can tell you yep. what that number Same. was. Yep. If I had to tell you my brother's cell phone number, I couldn't tell you. No. There's not a need to memorize it. I pull up the phone. So it takes, it, 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 it actually does not allow us to continue to expand. Exactly. So the usage of it is really important. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Or, or just very simply getting dancers to dance not so small. You know, mm. they're, they're, the dancers already have issues with, with confidence and being brave enough to dance their full kinesphere, mm. to, you know, and so now they're dancing in these tight windows, and mm. it's very wow. interesting. It's changed process uh, in the sense of attention span, being able to keep a lot of information. They always want me to take a video of everything, and I'm like, mm. no, we're not doing that. Right. You know, I need you mm. to, I need you to remember, I need you to feel, um, and especially with the styles with with jazz and hip hop, those are styles that are based in style and aesthetic. They're, they're not foundationally based in line and shape. And so I keep telling these students, you can study, you can watch TikTok all day and give me the output of the shape. Mm -hmm. But why you love the creators you love and the people you love is because they are, they are somewhere else. They're inside of their own feel, their own aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And the line and shape is the result of that. But that's where the great, to me, the, the great dancers are the ones who are really like moving the, the field forward. Those are the people that I resonate with. Are those people that are like about, does this feel good? Am I, am I one with the music? Do I understand my relationship with the music? Um, and so I feel, and it, going back to just the, the, this theme of social change, you know, in many ways, I don't consider myself like an activist or anything, but now that I'm thinking, you know, I'm sitting here listening to everybody, I'm like, yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> because what I'm doing here is I'm trying to make sure you connect back to culture and you understand why. Like, this dance isn't just a, this ain't just the Bart Simpson. We're not just doing a thing, which is a hip-hop move. Um, just bring up Bart Simpson randomly. But, like, these things are named, these hip-hop moves are named after iconic cultural cultural icons that were happening in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Like, all of this dance that you're doing, you're not just dancing. This is all a response to mm. everything socio-political that was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. We call mm -hmm. something the Watergate, yeah. not because <laughs> we just decided it's the Watergate, but it is a hip-hop and locking move yes, that was named after what was going on at the time. So, mm. when, so that's the way I teach, and it's not always the most popular. And I'll have students go come into the classroom, and they won't complain, but I know they talk about me. Uh, and they'll either wonder why we're not learning a bunch of combinations. Like, I just want combinations. I just right. want string. I want string together phrases. And I stopped teaching that way a long time ago because I wanted them to understand the this the foundational steps and the history behind the steps, mm -hmm. so that they could see that this isn't just something you can pick up easily. This, you're, you're, and not only are you dancing, but you're carrying culture and, and history on your, on your back. Mm. So take care of it. So that's just how I feel about that. Yeah. I think, too, it's like, you know, the, the older that I'm getting, I'm just like, you know what? I have to love enough not to care. And what I mean by that is, is, mm -hmm. you know, in our ecosystem that we have, I'm the oldest person. And I'll be 43. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is, you know, between the ages of 18 and 29. I have to love you enough not always to care about what's in the moment being the terminal be-all, end-all, because there's a bigger plan, a bigger vision that is incumbent. Like, like It's contingent upon you having a deeper understanding than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so if you're with me, like I have a responsibility when you come to me and you're talking about something that you want to have happen in 10 seconds to say to you, I love you enough to go, no. We're not doing that. Don't come to me about that until you can come back and tell me five artists that like have had impacted or do this or you you want to do this stuff but you you ain't you can't listen to Donny Hathaway. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You you don't you can't tell me about 
you know, you know these, these folks who have like really rooted, we get into this all the time, that we get, who, who's your top five singers? And when I list my top five singers, there's people who, you know, have passed away or who are older and they're like, well, what about this person? I said, well, they stole it from this person. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's you know, literally a remake yeah, of, the, right. of so-and-so right, song. Right, right. Oh, have you seen, yeah. you seen this song on TikTok? I'm like, have you heard the original? <laughs> you know, so I, so, I, so I just think that, like, you know, in, even in this city right now, I feel like we're in a, a unique time and place where a lot of the people who are in these seats with some of these cultural and especially artistic institutions are people who can do things uniquely in a way that they couldn't have been done even five years ago and who get it in terms of like, no, it's time to really start passing on mm -hmm. and plussing up, utilizing this cultural legacy and knowledge that we have. Okay, so now you lead me to, because we have 70 minutes, right? We have about nine, eight minutes left. So you lead me to, and Brian, thank you so much. Um, you lead me to my final question that I want you all to respond to. And it's really about legacy. Um, and it is what institutions need to be built, supported, or destroyed by artists? <laughs> I will say that um, <clears throat> artists need to, and I like who we have all up here because I can I know from each and every one of you that we all do this. Artists need to begin to support other artists again. Mm. This is what we're all about. When I was reared in the arts, everyone had a part. It was not a segregation of the arts. It wasn't like you do the <laughs> you draw this and, and you build this and then you come in and you video this and then you all be the talent and then, um, and but it was everyone coming in to make this group effort work and be unified. And now it, you have to pull teeth to get an, an artist just to support another artist. Mm. You know, it, it's rare you, but that we can look out and see another singer or another dancer at our own concerts or, yeah. and, and presentations and things like that. So I, I do think that artists need to be more supportive and inclusive of all of our art forms. The word that keeps coming to mind for me is community. And I know that doesn't really address <clears throat> the institutions, and I'm kind of scared to address the question because we don't have enough time to address that. But I think before you contemplate building something you call an institution, we do have to return to a sense of community because, for instance, everything that Victor was talking about, AFO Records, Alvin Batiste, Harold Batiste, mm -hmm. Alvin Fielder, Kid Jordan, Clyde Kerr Jr., these people didn't just teach people. They were friends with people. They knew people. They raised people. It's a, it's a famous trombone player, uh, Trombone Shorty. Mm -hmm. I watched Kid Jordan palm his head like a grapefruit when he was a little bitty kid. <laughs> Shorty, get over here. Yeah. And that, that, that kid bucked up and came right there. And then when he picked up that horn, we said, how, did, how can you be that little and play the a trombone? You can't even reach fit position. But, uh, uh, and I think that's something very special about New Orleans in particular, another discussion separate from the South about a whole lot of other political things, but New Orleans created a, a situation where you do see five little bitty kids trying to hit fifth position in the backyard with their older brothers. Yeah. I'm talking about a, a trombone thing where you gotta stick your arm way out. Mm -hmm. Because they are raised up they do raise up their own community, yeah. you know, and in a lot of other parts of the South, that was discouraged, even prohibited. But uh, I think now we're in a whole new world where we do need to start interacting with each other, supporting each other, 
a lot of the knowledge about the music and the dance that's not passed on is because you didn't go to Taco Bell with Alvin Fielder that's and right. stay there for two hours while he listed every drummer and the drummer's teacher and the drummer's family and where they came from. And his people did this and his people did that. And you know why he played like that? Well, because he studied with this person. And the, that's passed on not in a school. So if you want to get your school right, you got to first of all get the real reference as to how true knowledge is passed. Mm. And it is passed at the dinner table. Okay. You know. I think when you start, when you use the word institution, people start thinking about, you know, brick and mortar type of situations, whether it's a university over here, I'm, I'm not going to name any universities, or another university over that. But the institution for me that I grew up with was my community. And it was that situation, not only musically, but socially mm -hmm. in the neighborhood that was a said, if you go around the corner and you did something that was incorrect, oh, yeah. you might get a whipping around the corner. Then when you come home to tell about the whipping you got around the corner, you got the whipping at home again. <laughs> or actually the message got home before you got home and you got yep. what you were going to get. So, you know, that institution yep. is, the community was the institution. And my teachers in school were my teachers out of school. I, I didn't depend on any one place to teach me. And many times there were people I didn't know at the beginning, but I got to know as well as my family all along. I always thought being from New Orleans was unfair for everybody else as a musician because everybody <laughs> around there was a teacher, you know? Right, Whether right. you, you mentioned so many people. I'm impressed you know all those people, uh, you know. But, and there's a whole list of them that we grew up in, grew up with in New Orleans. And there's a whole list of them that existed in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see that be recognized in a much more um, prominent way um, as I become a, a member of the community here. But I, I think we have to take advantage of the communities that exist here. And um, you know, I think about two young men, and I, I, I've gotten to know really personally, I don't mean to, to single them out, but Kendrick Smith and Bernard um, Terry. Terry, yeah, you know, and they've invited me into their community. So they take me around the city and keep me in a safe place. And not that any place is dangerous, I don't mean it in that regard, but I'm talking about a safe place of making sure that I'm being introduced to the other people in the community. So our institutions are, are our community, and we can only be as powerful as our communities are. And we have to, we have to break down the divides, you know, that exist up in here. In my short term um, in St. Louis already, I've become informed about the divides that, that live here. But uh, I would like to see those erased. And it's not going to be an easy discussion. Again, like I said before, it's not going to be a short conversation, but it's a necessary one. And I think we, can, we do have to build it. We need to sustain it. And those that need to be maybe removed, and there are some you know, that need to be removed, we can do that as well. Mm. Yeah. I definitely agree with community and true mentorship. And I mean true community, not this checks a box or you know, oh, I did that thing for you, so remember that time. Like, I, as someone who, coming back from school, in, from Texas, and wanting to start something here, um, I didn't feel like a fit anywhere as far as how I moved and things like that. And I'm only sharing that personal because I would love to see those emerging artists who are trying to just produce art and it doesn't not, maybe not necessarily for money not just because they love it wanting to find those communities to connect with now it has grown a lot in 15 years um since i've been creating art but for public facing art i, I would say i've been creating art my whole life but mm -hmm. um, public facing but it's it was interesting trying to like figure out what box do i fit in and there was no box so i created a box and i'd like to see more of that true mentorship, not, oh, I, I'll say I'm your mentor, but you need to do X, Y, and Z because that's the way I did it. It's empowering the next generation to do what they want to do, how they want to do it, and inspiring them, and I'd like to see that. But I also want to say that we need more artists in general at every table because we are improvisers by nature. We think outside the box by nature. We challenge sometimes without even knowing it just True. the discourse mm -hmm. and you know, just the way things, procedures, how things are have been, we challenge that anyway. Because we, if we're entertaining or we're saying something overtly sociopolitical, we're, we're, we're wanting change for ourselves, for others. And so therefore, I just feel like 
where the artist activism can be played up more. Maybe we really are out, it, we're at the table, we're at the chamber, we're, we're having a seat, because I think just the way we think as artists, we need in our world right now, mm. so. And we have to help institutions realize that they need us. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know, and not from the standpoint of like, that I can't exist without you. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you, there are unique challenges that you face that you need creatives mm -hmm. to help you deal with. Right. And part of that for creatives is sometimes getting outside of your brand identity and looking at the sales and services that you actually can provide to institutions. And instead of always asking them for a grant to fund your passion, right. you say, well, you know what? I actually have this skill set that can service you, mm -hmm. which you would have to pay me <laughs> to do. <laughs> then I can take that money and do whatever I want to do with it. Mm -hmm. right? I, I think it's like we, we, we've been asking the permission of institutions mm -hmm. We don't need to ask and we don't need to ask, we don't need to ask permission. One of the things that I learned by being at an institution, a, a cultural institution here in St. Louis for about ten years, mm -hmm. is how they think. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, I can think like that, mm -hmm. and 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 utilize the same way that you build partnerships. I can build partnerships. The same way that you leverage, you know, a nonprofit. That I can. We can do that same thing." But we feel so limited when we think that we need the institution. And I also stop holding institutions hostage to doing or not doing things that really ain't in their scope to do anyway. Right. Mm. That's true. I live in my community. You don't. I don't have to put an expectation on you of what you should be doing to, to help in terms of using the creative space in the arts. I'm going to put that on me. I'm going to accept that as a responsibility, but I'm also going to use the same techniques that you use to build out the partnerships to get grant funding for mm -hmm. stuff that you don't really do, right. that you don't have capacity to do, mm -hmm. that you don't holistically want to do, mm -hmm. but you just want the money for. I can use the same stuff that you do to actually fund what is indigenous mm. Come on, indigenous. to my person. <laughs> It's, 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 what I, it's what it's what right it's what it's what it's right what That's I want right. to do. So so instead of me saying, hey, I need you to give me money to get a grant so that I can do this for these for these young people, it's like, well, I work with these young people already. Help me get these houses on my street so I can get them housing. Mm -hmm. Help me give them a stipend. Right. Right. It's 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 the same stuff that, that, that Cortex does for the tech space. That's what we have to do for the creative space. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Use those same principles, those same infrastructures. And bring them over and think like that. But but it, but as long as we are dependent upon the institutions to do for us, then we'll never do for ourselves. And you raise up a generation of people and creatives who still always going to be looking at handouts mm -hmm. instead of what's looking in their hands and going, oh, this is worth this is worth a million dollars. What's in my hand? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you a proposal about that. Mm -hmm. Then take that money and be our own institution, and we giving out grants yeah. and we're funding things. Yeah. That Thank bring, you. That, Thank bring, you. that brings me back to just a simple line that I heard when I was coming up in dances. <clears throat> don't you don't always ask for a seat at the table. Just make your own table if mm. that's what you yeah. need. <laughs> yeah. The only thing you need yes. and you want and invite them to your table. Yeah, invite them to do our table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I'm trying to think who was the famous activist, the first black woman to run for president. Unbought and unbossed. Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm says something very similar yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, thank you so, so much. I could talk to you all forever. And I know that sounds cliche at the end of these sorts of events, but really my brain is just a fire with all of the different connections and ideas. I, I hate to end it here, but I have to end it here because I want to respect the time. The program's executive producers are Oxford American, Gateway Arch National Park, and Jazz St. Louis. Support was provided by Jefferson National Parks Association, Stella Boyle Smith Trust, and Gateway Arch Park Foundation. A special thanks goes out to the panelists, Christopher Parker, Kelly Hurt, Victor Goyens, Ashley Tate, and Brian Owens, and to the moderator, Treasure Shields Redman.
Video and audio production were provided by Key Productions and Alumni Broadcasting Association.